Tom Miller, Simplex Grinnell. Warren Anderson, Summit Fire Protection. Here's you. Tony Martino, twice retired. Go <laughs> 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 so, ahead. Tony Martino, ASC Fire Protection. Sam Gavadi, ASC Fire Protection. David Holy with New Mac Companies. Campbell, New West Fire Protection. Rich Pearson, Chicago Fire. Jay Wentworth, Warfire Design. Ed Meyer, Warfire Design. Kevin Opus, Simplex Grinnell. Kevin Opus, Simplex Grinnell. Dave Deputy, Kepper Insurance. Kathy Rutherford, GE Global Asset Protection Services. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 We did that one. Dave <laughs> Johnson, <laughs> Nelson Engineered Self. Kurt Olson, Olson Fire. Kim Levine, Olson Fire. Dave Gardner, Simplex Grinnell. Petrosky, Holberg Engineering. Comment itself, which I fully heard. Chris Jennifer, Norton and Fire. Gordy Bates, Minneapolis Fire Department. Brian Gearworth, Mount Star. Steve Boyd, here on Tank and Engineering. Scott Petrell, Petrell Fire. Mm -hmm. Brian Andes, Minnesota Town of Fire and Safety. Mm -hmm. Ken Strand, Petrell Fire. I'm Al Moore, Rashad Julie Erickson. I want to welcome you back. It's good to see everybody again. Um, I'm going to put some sheets on your tables, a little homework to do tonight. We want to find out what you're interested in for uh, programs, for future programs this year. We've got some established for the beginning of the year, but we're always looking for ideas. We can just, you know, hopefully somebody at your table has a pen, because I only have one. Um, just write down whatever ideas you have for programs that you'd like to see. And then uh, also this year, <coughs> our current executive board in terms are over with. So we, we're going to need a new president, a new vice president, a new treasurer, a new program chairman. And so we'd also like you to uh, either nominate somebody or if you're interested yourself, write your name down. Um, and then what we do is we, we take back that information and, and we'll meet as an executive board and, and make some selections. So please please take some time to put some of that information down sometime tonight and that'll help us out quite a bit. Ken, do you want to give a brief uh, treasurer's report? Sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a year-end report I did from last year. Um, I don't have extra copies, but if anybody wants to look at it, come find me. Uh, basically, starting in this July to end of June, it's our fiscal year. Starting uh, July 1st, 2001, we had roughly $2,700 in our account. At the end of that fiscal year, we were at $8,640. Whoa! And the reason is the uh, SFP chapter breakfast we had. Ooh, that's what I was doing. Yeah, a lot of Yes. And since then, <coughs> that year we've uh, purchased a camcorder and a tripod, and a couple other donations floated in. And right now we're at $9,792. Buy things that go on. I don't know where that 
and the executive board members need to be SFPD national members. We're, we've decided that this group has not done that in the past. Uh, we prefer to do that, but it's, it's not going to be mandatory. So I, I just want everybody to feel free to participate if, if it wants to. Do Dues uh, didn't change this year. We're still at uh, 25 for membership, and, and then the weekly programs are 20 for members and 25 for non-members. So if, we, if you want to become a member, you can pay for your, your, your uh, annual dues in about five programs. So if you can, if you want to get your annual membership. Um, SFPE has a whole lot of new brochures. They've got examples of the uh, fire protection engineering magazine. They've got digital applications, all kinds of information. But you can't see it because I left it back at my office. So I'll bring it next next month. I guess with that, uh, uh, Warren is our education chair, Warren Anderson, and I asked him just to. Uh, at each meeting, point out any educational opportunities that come up from various fire protection organizations. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for, mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. In addition to the SFP continuing education that I will bring next week, um, I found one the Minnesota Building Codes and Standards is putting on now. Uh, it's on the uh, new International Building Code. It's a uh, seminar in this fall and winter. And we've got the state pretty much covered all the way from Duluth down to Rochester. So, uh, as part of that seminar, they require you to bring the new uh, code book right here. And that's available at the Minnesota Bookstore. It's about 80 bucks. Yeah, I've got a listing of the gates from the Thanks, Mark. Okay. Also, uh, Scott Petrell is our liaison to the Governor's Council. And I know he's been busy with that, and he has some uh, an update that he'd like to present to us here. So, okay. Yeah. Well, and when Al asked me to speak tonight, he said I had an hour and a half, so I don't think that's going to be a problem. I've had enough material here for quite a bit longer than that. It was an hour and a half. But <laughs> yeah, well, whatever you say. <laughs> well, um, the people throw food at <laughs> you. One time, eat your ice cream. I, don't know. I do. Uh, I have been in the I've been the liaison for the past for the uh, governor's council for quite some time. About a year ago, I expressed a concern to the governor's council about uh, fire protection in the in the future, and um, the the education that is going to that is going to be necessary at all levels to work with the codes and standards and changes that we see coming. Um, the most obvious of that would be performance-based design. Uh, it's one thing for the engineering community to be uh, up and running with performance-based design, but how do the, uh, the rest of us, the rest of us in uh, fire protection get involved, get up to speed? And I'm talking about the AHJs, the, the contractors, the architects, the building owners, and the building managers. Um, and that's and, and the insurance industry, and that makes up. The, sorry, yeah. <laughs> um, but that's what makes up the governor's council is, is basically those groups along with the NR and a few others. Um, well, so they said, hey, great idea, Scott. Why don't you chair a task force and uh, come back with some recommendations for us? Well, I put together a great group of people, um, and it's uh, we've met uh, rather infrequently until the last few months. Um, we finally uh, decided that the direction we were going, Tom Brace asked us to look into two things specifically. One was uh, structural protection of uh, utilizing sprinklers instead of spray on or any other type, and, uh, and performance based design in general. Well, we, uh, the group is made up of uh, uh, Kathy Rutherford, um, John Hoppe, uh, Will Berger. Tom Mantel, Jerry Norman from the State Building Code Division, Steve Zakhar, uh, Rich Pearson, and Michael Heron and myself. So we've got a broad base. We've got all the different, uh, many of the different disciplines <coughs> covered. And what we have done is we have prepared, first thing we did was we looked at how performance-based design in 
general um, needs to be looked at in our opinion. And we, we developed a flowchart that I'm going to hand out. Um, I guess I'll just walk around and hand out talk. Um, and it's kind of a complex looking thing, but I think it really points out the need for education in all these groups when we start working with things that are no, no longer prescriptive codes. You can't look at the code and say, this is exactly how I want to do it. You have to look at it in a manner and say, what are the objectives? How are we going to reach those objectives? And, and you really don't necessarily have a set of uh, any criteria to look at to determine that. This flowchart gives a little bit of an idea how we think things might need to flow. We took the flowchart then and started looking at what's critical to a uh, performance-based design, if you will. And we came up with, this is a draft copy only. The task force is going to meet again to review this, but this is our consensus statement or our position paper. And I know we don't have the time for everybody to read this tonight. I want to point out a few parts of it so that you know where we're going with this. If you have some comments, feel free to. What are you doing? Um, feel free to uh, um, email me if you've got some comments. Uh, but what we have done here is uh, put in writing what this group feels. Um, and again, like I said, this is a draft. We are, it isn't consensus at this point because the, the seven or eight of us have not met one last time to make sure that we're all in agreement with everything that's written down. But um, basically what we said on the structural fire protection issue is that we don't think we can say, we don't feel we can recommend that it should be a no, you can't do it, or a yes, you can do it. Thing. It is a case-by-case -case basis. Thanks. You got to look at the buildings. You got to look at the community. You got to look at what's going on in that building to see if it's going to be something that could or shouldn't be used. But in light of that, we've come up with five recommendations that we're prepared to make to the to the governor's council, and hopefully then that will go on to the state fire marshal's office for additional um, implementation, if you will. And they're on page four, the recommendations. Um, we're looking at adopting some language similar to that proposed for the International Fire Code. We'd like to see that both in the Fire Code and the Building Code. We want to define the codes and standards that are acceptable for design and review of the performance-based design submissions. We'd like to insist on competent, unbiased, ethical reviews, third-party reviews. We want to establish statewide guidance for dissemination of critical input values. And last but not least, we want to develop guidance for maintenance of the PVD. And our thought is that maintenance of the PVD means that it's a living document, if you will, that, that if you're doing a performance-based design and there's lots of different aspects of it in a, in a given building, if you're doing performance-based design, all the documentation that goes with that has to be tied to the life of that building. You change the, the remodeling, Whatever might be going on, you have to tie that performance-based design to that, and we're going to recommend that it go and be tied to, to the deed of the building. Now, whether that can ever be implemented or not is a whole other story, but the, 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 the critical issue is that you can't have a performance-based design building or components of it that are not continually maintained in the manner they were originally uh, designed. So, or, yeah, originally designed. So we're looking at some way to give some recommendation to be able to keep follow through on the critical issues uh, associated with performance-based design. Um, this document that I've given you, we've already we found a couple little things that we might change in it. Um, as I said, it is a draft. It's a working document at this point. Um, I could stand up here and talk about things that we have discussed for a long time, but I want to go back briefly, and I know my hour and a half is almost up. I want to go back briefly and tell you that some of the things that we identified as critical items um, or concerns from the beginning, I want to give you a list of those. We started out with education. That was a thing. Um, how are we going to, and I don't mean we, I mean how is this community going to be educated 
in a manner that makes performance-based design or uh, use of alternative methods and materials or equivalencies, those kind of things. How are we going to do that so that everybody has a comfort level of what's being done? So the education of the, of the uh, HJs, the contractors, and the whole list, the whole group of us, is, is very important. We identify the problem as, as what is a, what's input data, what input data is used for any given uh, performance-based design. Where does that come from? Uh, structural engineer can go to a structural engineering handbook and find out most of the material, most of the requirement, most of the st structural materials in a given element, in a given component. We, on the other hand, can't grab the same type of uh, hard and fast data for everything we might be looking at. Um, there's subjective things that an engineer is going to put into this, and we're going to need to. Uh, we would like to see a database created so that you can look at performance-based designs that have been done, look at input values, um, look at testing that's been done, look at data that's been achieved from testing. Um, we'd actually like to see a, a database created where it, it's brought to a central clearinghouse. It's, it's shown on the flowchart. Um, the input data comes in and, and the final data comes in. So you've got this database you can look at. Bearing in mind that because you did it over here in this building, can't do it over there in that building. Everything may be different, or most of it may be different. But there's a lot of components that, that go into it and need to be uh, uh, integrated. Um, lack of guidelines, the questions that we were receiving and that we've heard of from um, AHJs, fire service questions, the safety of firefighters, contractor understanding, and engineering competency. Those are some of the things we identified as concerns in going through this process. Um, I will tell you that one in one shape form or another, this uh, document made it all the way to SFPE National Headquarters yesterday or the day before, and uh, it really wasn't ready to go there. So I had a uh, long conversation with Morgan Hurley at the SFPE, um, and I explained to Morgan that uh, we weren't. Uh, not that SFPE wasn't welcome, but I had to tell him who the group was that was putting this together and why we were putting this together. Um, I explained to him that it certainly was something we might send, might have sent to them for their their uh, information at some point, but they did get it. Uh, they did get a copy that um, none, no one on the task force was aware of. And uh, after talking to Morgan, he did tell me that he has the same, many of the same concerns. The concerns that we identified are not unique. In traveling across the country, he has seen the same things. Um, SFPE, I'm trying to go real fast here. SFPE has a performance-based design uh, guidebook that um, can be used. We're recommending that some, one of the established criteria be used. Uh, the ICC has guidelines, the NFPA 101 has guidelines. We're also recommending that ethical guidelines be established and utilized, and Morgan told me that SFPE in October will publish a new uh, SFPE peer review guidelines pamphlet. It will not publish it, it will be available on their website, so it will be free. I have a copy of that if anybody would like to see it. He's told me I can distribute that as a, as a draft. Um, so the things that we are working with in this position paper, the National Society is also working with at a, at a different level. Um, I think the difference there, and I think it's important, the critical difference to me is that our group is made up of many of the different uh, entities that are, that are involved in fire protection engineering, or the fire protection, not engineering, but fire protection, and uh, the, uh, the others, is, is the SFPE information is coming from the fire protection engineer side of this. So there is a difference in the way it's being looked at um, to some extent, and, and I like to think that our task force is a little bit more, a little bit more broad based. Okay, I rambled. I went through a whole bunch of stuff really fast. Um, I guess I should ask if there are any questions quickly, if there are any questions about this. You know, if you really want to talk about it in depth, um, you can do it afterwards or on the phone. Actually, I might not be here afterwards. I gotta, gotta get out of here, but. I'd be happy to talk to you guys about this. You know, we're, we're not trying to constrain the design team. We're not trying to, to take away creativity from an owner or a, or a design team. At the same time, 
we feel that there are some guidelines that need to be made, uh, guidelines that need to be uh, established to uh, make sure that uh, we're addressing all of the concerns um, that may not just be uh, simply cost, cost savings, cost, cost reductions. Um, so any questions? Yeah. That, that, not necessarily a question, but when you're talking about getting together now with the central, like a review group, I can see that as being a contractor. It would be something really important. So they're getting some off track, something like that, or trying to get some technical idea that you've got some source, somebody that you can bounce ideas off of and know where to go. I can see even for the way we are now, you know, setting plans out, that I can probably see that also for the different approval agencies. You know, when they get these plans in, they're going to want to go someplace that they can, can know what they're trying to prove or know what the ideas are as well. So a central house like that, I can see both sides really using that a lot. I can't say, I can't say any more. I agree. We, we agree with that, I would say. Um, I think uh, how you would ever establish that group would be a, a difficult thing. How would you get unbiased or how would you get, uh, how would you do that? But, but we think that's kind of, I agree. I think that's, would be very helpful. Anything else? Okay, let me just tell you a couple more things real quick. Then the governor's council today, um, we, a couple, uh, what was I getting by my notes? The uh, Governor's Fire Prevention Day at the fair was a smashing success. There were 471 volunteers, of which some of you in this room were. Um, thank you for doing that. There were 450 plus volunteer firefighters involved. The uh, fire, the state fair is just happy to have us uh, have it being uh, being done. Um, can't find the notes. The uh, they plan it again next year. It, it's they continue to uh, to try to grow that um, legislation legislative ish, issues for this coming session. Um, they expect fire resistive cigarettes to be back. I guess the uh, author and the chairman of the committee didn't like each other, so that's why that one died. Um, they expect the ret high-rise retrofit to be back next year. Um, gosh, there were a couple more that were residential. Um, I don't remember who talked about that today. Is that going to come back on the agenda? No, I just asked. Uh, I, I don't. I don't think that was one of them. At least, and, and they were just touching on some of the things that uh, that they feel strongly are going to come back up. Well, I can't find any other notes. But uh, if you have any ideas, <coughs> let's see. Um, oh, I, I don't know. I'm, how many of you attended the? Just, just for the fun of it, how many of you attended Governor's Governor's Fire Prevention Day Fair? You guys were probably volunteers too, weren't you? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, let me just say to the rest of you, you missed quite an experience. And it really is. It's scattered throughout the fair. Uh, have all kinds of things going on, for young or old. Um, they, uh, one, of the, one of the best things at the, at, the, at the whole deal was the memorial service that they had. Um, Michael Israel did a painting. Uh, he's a pretty famous painter. Uh, whether you've seen it or not, his work or not, a lot of his work has to do with 9-11. Um, but he did a six foot by six foot canvas that spun, was spinning. And he had music going and audience participation. And this is at the memorial service. I, you know, I'm dead serious. Did you guys see it? Did you see it, David? No. He, he um, to, to the music, he, he put paint on his hand, paint on brushes, and he did, you know, he's doing all this stuff. And it's, this thing's spinning around. And he does this, and he does this, and he spins it some more. And you thought it was going to be a flag. Last minute, literally the last minute out of 15 minutes, it was a firefighter with a child in his arms. And that that uh, painting, then he turned and gave to NFSA, auction off and burn aid, and they got three thousand dollars for it. So that was a that was a very successful thing there. Um, if if we can do anything as a group to be more involved next year, I think that would be a great great idea. Uh, you know, certainly many of our, uh, many other of the groups that we are associated with are in it. Next, next session is high-rise fireworks bill. They think it's, they're going to come back, try to legalize more. 
Uh, building and fire code adoption is going to be important. There will be $3 billion in debt, it appears. There will be budget cuts of, the, of that. Um, K through 12 education is 50% of the budget. The state agencies are only 8% of that budget. So you're going to be looking at some pretty hefty either tax increases or budget cuts or both for next year. And just for your information, officially at this point there were 93 fireworks related incidents treated at, in emergency rooms. Uh, 35 to 37 is the average for other years. St. Paul had 24 runs as of, as of the morning of July 4th. Um, fireworks related runs, they normally have three. There were uh, two amputees, two juvenile amputees. And there were two bomb-making juveniles who took uh, scraped sparklers into pipe and fuses from legal smoke bombs, and one put it in a, one put it in a uh, mailbox, and the other one put it someplace else. In separate cases, they weren't working together. So that's the information that comes from the state fire marshal's office. Like Twenty years. Scott, are they uh, looking at going uh, to the legislature with updating the uh, fire alarm code? That wasn't that wasn't brought up specifically. Anything else? Thanks a lot, Scott. Yeah, I mean, state has said that they're not going to do anything. Yeah, it's just a great couple now. other things in the whole third program. Um, one is that uh, we got a code uh, update from Tom and Bill today that. Uh, this is, this is talking about the adoption process for the Minnesota State Building Code and State Fire Code. Codes uh, be published in the State Register on October 7th, and there's a 30-day waiting period. It starts on the 7th. During that period, if, if 25 requests are received for a public hearing, then they'll have a hearing conducted on December 3rd. An adoption date would, would probably occur early in 2003. If they don't have 25 requests, then the state will go ahead and adopt it on December 1, 2002. Good. December? January 1? Oh. December 1. Are we talking about inclusive of the, uh, the new NPA of 2002? NPA 13, 2002, is that going to be part of that? In 99. In 99. 99, is it? Okay. This, then we this get to adopt the 2002. Okay. This is uh, the IFC and the uh, yeah, the International Fire Code, the International Building Code, and their amendments, which, is which would adopt the 1999 edition of NFPA 13. NFPA 17. Why is? I mean, I'm just curious. Why are we always in the fire side of it further behind than the electrical people are in the electrical side of it? Because their code is adopted without amendments. That's the short of it. If you look at, there's been a group that has met monthly for the last two and a half years looking at amendments. They're already starting now looking for the amendments to the next international code that we would adopt three or four years later. And it's because we do all types of amendments where the national, the national electrical code is adopted. It's two sentences to adopt it. The fire code is going to be adopted with 40 or 50 pages of amendments. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It depends on your perspective. I mean, okay. if, you, if you can live with the national code, it's a bad thing, but if you feel that I mean, the national code in some way doesn't meet what you want to do for existing buildings, or for say you want additional building sprinkler or things like that, then you have to put amendments in the code. Okay, so it's not just a cost issue; it's a performance issue. Also. It's a performance issue. The, the fire service in Minnesota has certain feelings about existing buildings that they may want more required in existing buildings, and so there's a lot of there's amendments put in for that. Maybe. Uh, Alarm systems in residential buildings, they want more than the base code would require. For example, uh, an existing hotel or an existing bed and breakfast, they want to meet almost the same requirements for new. And so they put in amendments. And each time you do that, it increases the complexity of the adoption. It, it's not an easy process just to say, well, instead of the 1999 edition of 13, let's just adopt the 2002. We'll put that number in there, and because we know it's going to take a year to adopt it, the problem is, anytime that's referenced, you have to go in and compare it. So the fire code will say, go to NFPA 13 section 2.1.3.2. Well, if you change additions, that numbering changes. You have to go back and change it. So if something's already been through the governor's office and the legislative auditor and all of this, you have to repeat that process. Well, now if that, anyone in that process changed, 
you have to start it all over again. So, it, so it's one of these, the train's already left. Okay. Which, in mentioning, if you do want to see newer editions of codes adopted, such as 72 or 13, that comment period is very important because the, that comment period is the time where you can say, we want the newer edition now that it's available. It wasn't available when you guys started working on this code two and a half years ago. And so by sending in your comment, 25 people do that, <clears throat> it goes before uh, a legislative hearing judge, and you can go and make your case and say, we, the industry, want this newer standard because it offers us more flexibility, whatever the reason. And um, my experience is you tend to do very well when you bring your case forward that way, okay. whether you get the 25 people or not. In other words, they don't want to have things be controversial. And so it's easier to then go, okay, yeah, all right, we'll really do that. Okay, gotcha. And so that comment period, a lot of people miss it and they don't realize it, but if there are issues that the codes are not addressing that you feel it's important, that's your input into the process. You had sent a note out an email or something? What the uh, information you just told us about the comment period and the adoption oh, sure. period. Sure. I mean, you can have certain jurisdictions adopt uh, a policy that says we'll accept the 2002 edition of NFPA 13, but there's still, if somebody goes out and writes orders or what you actually really have to do is still the one that's adopted legally, and that's the 1999 edition. You could say, well, can I use the 2002? And they'd say, yeah, fine, we'll do our plan review according to that. But if anything gets real messy, it always falls back to what's legally adopted. Rich, you stopped. Uh, you know, it's an important point to understand why the adopted in 99 and not the 2002, and that is that the State Attorney General's Office will not allow the adoption of a document that has not been formally adopted by NFPA. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. when the process started, NFPA 13 and 72 were going to be voted on at the May meeting of NFPA. So when they started the code writing process, technically the Attorney General's Office didn't recognize 2002 because it hadn't been ratified at that point. So that's why the 99 Oh well, yes, I was, my comment, Tom, was just more or less, you know, I, I know the electrical people, they're always like 12 months maximum. <laughs> It takes them to get a new code adopted, mm -hmm. and it seems like we're taking three to four years well, and, and more in some of these things to pick. But it that's, up. I was just curious. Yeah, the, the electrical folks are simply adopting right. an they're installation going down standard, the standard. Right. Whereas you're the building and the fire people, they're adopting an entire code. It would be much so. You know, if we were just doing 72 or just doing 13, I think you could see <laughs> that type of adoption. But where there's 90 different standards referenced in the fire code or Something like that. Each of those has to be looked at the date. It's. You also understand the process to, for adopting 13 and 72 is a three-year cycle process, and you've got to report on proposals and report on the comments. Yeah. And there's good and bad to that. It's a three-year cycle, so that if you're expecting something to happen quicker, it yeah. doesn't. But it's also a good process in that it's a three-year. It's a good thorough cycle and also a process so that when you finally get to the floor and they bring up 13 and they bring up 72 you know you can have the floor you can talk and it's a very good uh, review process that happens I, so there's good and bad to it right and in my particular case i was more interested when this all started was on the fire alarm cable the two already cable mm -hmm. you know and when i come in minnesota i found out that we're Two years ago when I started looking at that cable as a viable product for this area, and I was shocked to learn that mm -hmm. we were still on a 93 alarm code. I mean, we're one of the few people in the country, and from what I found, that was still back on 93 alarm code. Everybody else was, a lot of our neighbors around, the states around us are, were on 96 at that point. So. In 96 had its opportunity to be adopted, but for a number of reasons, it's it wasn't adapted. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> shirts are for sale for twenty-five dollars. I, I just brought one tonight, but if if you're interested in getting a, a local chapter shirt, uh, let me know. We have lots of sizes and, and lots of stock, so we can take care of that. So, without further delay, I'll introduce our speakers. We have uh, Steve Bohag, who has 22 years of experience as product manager for Aerotank and Engineering. He's going to talk about 
Home Systems, and Brian Andes is going to compliment him. He's the uh, sales manager of Minnesota Fire, in Minnesota Conway Fire and Safety, and he's going to discuss more of the detection side of it. So, with that, uh, I'll hand it over to you guys. Everybody see that with, with this here? And push that down a little bit. That helps. Yeah. Pleased to be here tonight. I appreciate the invitation. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Arrow Tank, uh, uh, we're a steel fabricator. We make a lot of pressure vessels for a wide variety of uh, industry applications. Uh, we make a lot of propane tanks. Uh, chances are, if you see a propane tank on the back of a, uh, a truck, we made it. And uh, not just the tank, but a lot of times we put the whole assembly together also. So we're and last I heard, the largest uh, manufacturer of uh, bobtail propane tanks in the country. Um, fire protection, uh, we got into this in the mid-70s. Uh, 3M brought us into it. But I guess we've kind of outlasted it here a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Not by my choice, let me tell you. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight. The title is a little misleading. I'm really not going to talk that much specifically about full proportion. <clears throat> I'm going to give you more of just a, an overview, a summary of AFFF use uh, in sprinkler systems. So, ah, yeah. no, way. types of uh, concentrate that are used in sprinkler systems over the years have been uh, protein-based foams. Uh, then kind of along came the uh, floor protein base, which has had a surfactant added to it. Uh, film forming foam proteins. And the uh, oculus film forming foams, which we're most commonly familiar with, which is AFFF and the alcohol resistant AFFF. I'm a little biased, so we're going to concentrate tonight on, uh, on AFFF. AFFF basically comes in uh, two varieties. Uh, the base AFFF, which is available at 1, 3, and 6%. Uh, very seldom you see a 6% AFFF used anymore. Uh, just really not cost effective to have a 1,000 gallon tank when you can have a 500 gallon tank. 1%s have been around for years and years and years, um, just never really caught on. I think there's still a little bit of a, a mental block connected with just 1% proportioning margin of error. Uh, what if the orifice plate, which is fairly tiny, plugs up? You see it mostly in uh, large volume, like airplane hangers, where you'll see 1% most often. Uh, AFFF, strictly for use on hydrocarbon based fires, fuel oils, jet fuel. <coughs> that type of uh, <coughs> liquid. When you get into uh, situations in the uh, flammable liquid storage and uh, chemical areas, now you're looking at uh, water-soluble materials, you've got to go with the alcohol resistant AFFF. And basically what that is, it's an AFFF that's had polymer added to it, where AFFF is more like apple juice, alcohol resistant is more like snot. <laughs> different manufacturers, <laughs> different <laughs> consistencies. So, uh, you can use this on either hydrocarbon or water soluble uh, final liquids. Now, over the years, back when it first came out, it was a 6 and a 9. 9% on uh, polar solvents, 6% on hydrocarbons. You know, and they improved it down to 3 by 6. Got down to, I suppose, in the early 90s, it came out with 3 by 3. <coughs> 
started cutting into our tank sizes, obviously. And now, of course, you can use a 3% of hydrocarbons, 3% of the polar solvents. And of late, you now, everybody's trying to get a foot up on everybody else. So there are some 2 by 3s out there, I believe. Usually the 2% of hydrocarbons, it's usually some limited applications. I haven't seen it in sprinkler systems. I might be wrong, but I haven't seen it. And there's even a company out or two out there now that are pushing 1 by 3. 3% on polar solvents and 1% on, uh, on the hydrocarbons. But that's not in sprinkler system. I believe that's pretty much on uh, direct application with monitors or those lines. Advantages of AFFF is uh, obviously some lower application densities. Typical sprinkler application, you're looking at about 0.16. This obviously leads to lower head pressures, which reduces the amount of water you have to have, reduces your pipe sizing. Uh, you can use AFFF uh, with non-aspirated sprinkler heads. Again, it reduces cost. Uh, foam solution, once it's on the floor or on the structure, is very fluid. Uh, larger droplets uh, help penetrate the, uh, the fire pool. Once it's down on the floor, it moves around and gets up on the, the lakes and the beams and other obstacles that may be on the floor. Uh, as superior performance. Tests and actual uh, fire performance have shown that uh, AFFF is probably one of the best stuff out there. has a very long shelf life. Uh, when this stuff first came out, they were scared to say anything beyond four, five, six years. I think pretty much all the manufacturers out there are, are saying 20, 25 years and beyond of stored property. It yeah, smells better than protein foam. <laughs> <laughs> Anything goes. I think anybody would argue that. <laughs> Uh, various types of sprinkler systems, you guys are familiar with all that. Uh, open head deluge, probably one of the most common out there. Uh, very common application with, uh, with AFFF. Uh, closed head pre-action, we're starting to see that a little more often now uh, in airplane hangars. and getting away from the deluge systems because of all the false uh, dumps. AFFF solution on the avionics and expensive jet airplanes do not work. So they're going with the pre-action systems to uh, eliminate uh, that, uh, unfortunately. Closed head wet pipe systems, also becoming more and more common uh, with the advent of all the large storage facilities, uh, drum warehouses, uh, processing areas. So we're seeing more wet pipe systems can be used. To. Closed head dry pipe, you can use foam in these. You just don't see a lot of dry pipe systems because they're just kind of a slow reacting uh, sprinkler system. And you have flammable liquid fire acts, you don't want slow reacting sprinkler systems. The top three are the most common you're going to find. Design parameters uh, for designing a, a foam system, obviously the probably the four most common standards for covering foam are 11, 16, 30, and 409. But there's going to be a wide variety of other MFK standards that are going to be brought into the mix as you're as you're working on this. 13, obviously, but 15, I think 14, yeah, many other ones. But there's a bunch of them out there. Um, other parameters are going to be determined by the insurance underwriter. If he doesn't like the density of 0.25, he says I want 0.3. You don't have much choice if you want your insurance. So you have to listen to your underwriter. Authorities have insurance. Jurisdiction might have to be say about it. And uh, there might be a local ordinance or two that might affect your design also. How much foam? There's basically uh, one rule of thumb area times uh, application time times density times rate that you're proportioning. So it's like just roughly the size of your system. So if you have a post head system, Minimum is 0.16, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be higher. 0.25, uh, 0.3. Sometimes with the larger sprinkler systems, it's even more. Application time, again, minimum of 10 minutes, but uh, we're seeing a number of systems, uh, 15, 20, even 30, depending on the uh, carrier of the uh, situation. Design area, that's all over the board. 5,000 is what the NPA 16 calls for. For post head systems, uh, well, if you go in an airplane hangar, you're going to have up to, I think, 15,000 square feet per zone. And proportioning percentage, nine times out of <coughs> is going to be 3%. Occasionally, again, you see the 1%. 
You used to have a lot of six percent systems with uh, the alcohol resistant foam. Uh, the advent of three by three. Uh, I haven't seen a six percent system in years. So, although I do get a person called up every now and then, he's got six percent A triple left in his tank, which should have three percent. So that gets in the mix every now and then. Uh, final sizing of your system is going to be based on your hydraulic calculations. And your hydraulic calculations for a closed head system is basically. I recall demand is two. You have to calculate for your most demanding condition, and then you have to also run a calculation for your least demanding design area. So I'm just multiplying the area, the application, and the density, and the proportion percentage to get you in the ballpark for many purposes, but you've got to run your count and see what you're actually going to use. Delic systems, same basic formula, uh, 0.16. Most LA systems are always 10 minutes. I don't recall too many going more than 10. Uh, they'll go the entire <coughs> area of the LA system. Uh, airplane hangers, again, either 12 or 15,000 are going to fall off hand. Of course, you'll have multiple zones in those cases. And uh, hydraulic calculations there fall around 2015. <coughs> and basically, you're going to be adding roughly 20% to that calculation above to uh, balance everything out. Proportioning equipment, there's a variety of ways that you can get that foam into the sprinkler system. Uh, concentrate pump with a balancing valve, that was one of the original pump proportioning systems. You have an atmospheric tank, uh, usually an electric uh, proportioner pump, and uh, you're pumping into a uh, Venturi style proportioner, and there's a balancing valve that's in the return line back to the tank that just maintains the balance pressure state. Uh, obviously, is the basic ladder tank. That's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that just involves a pressure tank with a ladder. It's still balance pressure with a proportioner. But uh, then you have an ILVP with a concentrate pump. That's a variation of the first one where they took the balancing valves and then moved them out into the uh, around the perimeter where the risers were. So now you can take your system, you can portion the foam in one place, and pump the foam way out into the hangar area several hundred feet away, and the balancing valve would uh, do its thing out there <coughs> and control the flow of the anchor plug and the portion. And meanwhile, there's another balancing valve back in the return line of the tank, so the two of them are kind of working in conjunction. Uh, the ILVP with bladder tank uh, was developed by a company I do a lot of work with out of Michigan to kind of get some of that business away from the pump proportion. And what they basically come up with, you use the same type of ILVP, but you set it up so you put a little additional pressure on that bladder tank. It's like you're making that uh, bladder tank into a concentrate pump. So the additional pressure on the tank, that gets the foam concentrate out to the balancing valve proportion of higher pressure, where then it reduces down and balances out and accomplishes what that uh, pump is doing. So, other methods of proportioning, uh, these are some older ones. Direct orifice was used in the old days on the old deluge systems. Uh, they know what their water flow is going to be. They know what their concentrate pump will be. They just shoot it in there, uh, pre-sized orifice plate. Inline inductors, uh, not a good way to go for systems because their pressure loss is so high with the inductor. And pressure proportioning tanks, again, these are kind of used with protein foam. Uh, we've made a few of these for use at some ADM facilities in Cato and down in Iowa. Um, they don't work well they put the left because basically you have no bladder and you have a pressure proportioner on the top and the water just kind of comes in the top of the tank and just forces the foam down and down from the suction so, um, Works well with protein foam, uh, mainly because if you don't use the whole tank, protein foam is cheap and you haven't really lost anything. Triple F at a much higher price if you don't use the whole tank. Basically, have water and triple F mixed together. So, I've never really understand that system, but I was going to put a bladder in. <coughs> Again, I'm a little biased. I like bladder tanks, so we're going to talk a little more about bladder tanks. Uh, pressure tank, of course, the system is ULFM, like any of the portion systems are. The tank is 175 psi. You've got an internal bladder that's flexible concentrate goes inside the bladder and then the water comes in surrounds the bladder and squeezes it down uniformly until it's discharged. Uh, 
various uh, racial controllers, two inch, two eight inch in size, fit into the spread horizon. Uh, handle flows as low as 30 GPM and as high as 5,000 GPM. Uh, most ladder tank systems will involve uh, what they call non magnetic concentrate valve. This will be a ball valve that's located between the bladder tank and the proportionate. Normally closed, you can actuate it with a water power actuator. Uh, some companies use a deluge valve. Uh, specifically, think the Viking Corporation here. They use one of the little small, I think it's an H1 deluge valve, you can have two inch, two and a half, which is very slick. And you can also use an electric actuated ball valve, but I don't see that as often, and I'm not as big a fan of it because the power goes out. That valve, of course, is going to be slaved into your deluge valve for your <coughs> detection system, so that when it activates, it opens up the valve to the full connector. Uh, advantages of a bladder tank, simple operation. What more do you need? The deluge system trips, pressurizes the tank, water flows, and you have portion. There's no electrical power, you just stop water flow. Now, pumps don't operate. Obviously, you're not going to have water flow, but you have backup systems there. There's fewer components. You've got a tank, portioner, uh, a concentrate valve, of course, and your normal uh, components that make up your strip horizon. It's easy to install, They're set in place, a couple pieces of pipe, tied into the riser. Uh, it is ideal for deluge systems. Uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, and throughout the 80s, when we were doing a lot of these, all the systems that we were doing were deluge systems. And that trend has changed a little bit. You can protect multiple zones. You size that system for the largest single hazard, so you can have five, six, seven, eight risers going eight different uh, zones. And the tank is sized to handle the same as big, you know, biggest riser or hazard, and you'll have these multiple control valves, and whichever system dumps, that valve opens to that particular uh, control. And uh, maintenance, not much to take care of. Uh, you do your annual inspections, and it's 25 calls out. Uh, there aren't any moving parts. Very simple thing to happen. We've seen a lot of bladder tanks that have been very ignored for 20 or 25 years and are still in pretty good shape. They stuff them in corners under staircases. Yes. You know, forget about them. Disadvantages of bladder tanks. Bigger tanks, you get up over 2,500 gallons, 3,000, 4,000 gallons. They get pretty big and expensive. Uh, they're not exactly ideal for post end systems because what happens is for Racial proportioners have to have a minimum flow before they're going to proportion flow. And with the wide use of the uh, alcohol resistant concentrates, that just rises that low flow up even more because it's more business product. There's a couple companies that have come out with low flow proportioners that are a variation of the, uh, the old standard racial controller that we have. Uh, with different design and volume of proportion are much lower flow. So you can use a six inch controller, uh, which normally would have a flow range of maybe 500 to 3,000 gallons. Uh, these new variations will allow you to get down in some way to play one string like that. So, so they're out there. Um, they are time consuming to fill. Of course, if you're an expert like me, you can breeze right through it. And uh, bladder problem can be a little costly. Um, there are times out there where you are going to have a bladder problem, and it always happens in the tank and stuff the furthest away and the most difficult place to get to. It's never the one that's right there in the corner that you have lost to, to uh, access, but they can be a problem if they don't occur. Testing. Uh, I used to do a lot of testing when I first got started with Arrow back in the 80s. Um, you're basically you're going to be following your FDA 16 guidelines. Uh, your insurance carrier is going to have a lot of uh, influence on how you test that system. And of course your local authority is going to want to see some things too. And that's going to vary from site to site because each one wants to see something a little different. Uh, typical test going to include, <coughs> obviously have to, this doesn't include everything obviously. You're going to test your sprinkler piping, hydro test. You don't include the bladder tank. Bladder tank's already been hybrid tested. You want to keep that isolated. Um, you run the water into that bladder tank and squeeze that bladder down around the internal tubing, you're going to end up damaging something uh, without having to concentrate in it. Uh, you're going to be checking your component operation. 
including the alarm detection systems, checking the operation of the automatic concentrate valve, your alarm valve, the deluge valves, anything that's fire pumps, whatever's associated with the operation of the entire fire system. You're going to be verified that the water flow that the uh, design engineer says is there is there. Uh, so you're going to be checking, for, obviously, the fire pumps. And you're going to be checking uh, and verifying that it does proportion foam at the flow rate set to the lightning test. Uh, if you're testing a deluge system, typically what NFPA 16 requires is that you uh, first test from the single system. If you only have a single system, that's all you worry about. But if you have a multiple system, then you have to have a simultaneous discharge of the uh, maximum number of hazards. So like if we do an airplane hangar, might just test a single zone, and if it's uh, depending on the size of the hangar, you might have a total of three zones at maximum. And so you would dump the whole zone. Now, back in the early days, that's when testing was fun. You'd go out to the site in California, in Nevada, and you'd dump the whole works. Of course, you just sit there and calculate how we ran 600 gallons of foam at 20 dollars a gallon. It's kind of profitable for us. <laughs> but uh, times have changed. We don't do that anymore. Uh, <coughs> It could be quite a sight if you have the oscillating monitors going and the overhead going and foams be this high and something. They don't worry about it. Um, now that it's a little more controlled and uh, you're, you're verifying that that proportion is either with refractometer, which you're familiar with, and more, more common now I think is a conductivity meter. It's a little easier to read, it's a more accurate. Uh, refractometer is uh, kind of dependent on the person reading. You can have five people read it come up with five different readings, which can be a problem sometimes. Post end systems, uh, obviously, you can't discharge the whole thing. So you usually have to uh, set up some type of uh, test valve pattern. Uh, you're going to test at the low end of your design, or the low end of the proportion. And then you typically run a test at the high end of the system design. Now, a lot of times, when it gets up to the insurance carrier and the local authority, you can just kind of all reach a compromise, especially since you've got to contain all this stuff in some measure, and just shoot maybe a mid-range flow, and shoot it into a uh, containment pond, and shoot it into a directly into the truck, which will then haul it away. And occasionally, you run into the site where you just shoot it out to the back market. Again, we talked about uh, Test connections. Uh, usually that's going to be located just beyond the proportioner on the riser. Uh, a lot of times they'll put a block valve in the riser that they'll close for the test and then just run it right out the hose, single hose, multiple hoses, whatever you need to uh, achieve your flow. But this is something you got to work into your design ahead of time, knowing that you have to need to test the system, but not just for the initial test, you've got to look at annual tests down the road. So you got to have something so looking at the hose. Um, containing and disposing a foam solution, I mentioned that a little briefly, that's almost a necessity these days. Nobody wants to see bubbles coming down the street or coming down the creek. I, I remember a test up in Washington at Edna's Air Force Base. They were telling me about it. They had uh, valve in closed properly and they got foam into a creek. That creek went into the Potomac River and everybody saw it. The EPA was all over. So the test I was out there for, they were running around out in the tarmac with vacuum cleaners, and just made a little bubble that was going down. <laughs> so they were a little sensitive to the situation. Uh, you have to be concerned about future testing and inspection, and FDA 25 covers that from the agency. Uh, you have to, of course, your AFFF should be tested on an annual basis, uh, sent into a lab, we'll do a number of performance tests to make sure it's still makes a film, puts out fires, and does all the good stuff it's supposed to do. Uh, annual flushing, to have a pre-primed system. If you have a wet pipe closed head system, uh, a lot of people and like to recommend or insist that you have a pre-primed system so that you get foam on the fire as soon as possible. The trouble with the pre-primed system is you have to consider, consider it's going to be flushed out annually, which means you have to replenish that A triple F. It's going to be a large amount, but it adds up and also dispose of what you uh, drain out of the system. What's going on today? Well, AFFF is going to be. 
It's been going green for a number of years. The uh, manufacturers have been trying to put out the prettiest ad, the most flowers and wild animals on it. Um, a big event kind of came back here in May of 2000 out of the NFPA in Denver when 3M suddenly announced, uh, unbeknownst to the people in the booth, that they're getting out of business. So I kind of showed up at the uh, show that morning, half expecting to see all the competitors doing conga lines through the aisles or something like that. But they were rather, rather uh, reserved about it. But I learned of two, uh, two phrases or words I'd never heard of before. PFOS and PFOA. What's all this stuff? Currently what they are is what they call as uh, something along fluorinated intermediates or something like that. I don't know if any chemists here or not. But, um, they kind of changed the uh, way everybody looked at AFFF all of a sudden. Um, 3M having basically developed AFFF. I think it was, I remember looking at an ad that they put out back in the 60s where they had this stuff, which is typically how 3M comes up with all their, their good inventions. They have stuff they don't know what to use. So they find somebody to come in and help us figure out what to use this stuff for. Well, Navy came in, and pretty soon you have AFFF. Um, AFFFs have fluorinated surfactants, and in the industry there's basically two methods for manufacturing those surfactants for use in AFFF. There's the electrochemical process, which is what 3M used, and only 3M. And I hope I can pronounce this now. Telomerization, which is what everybody else uses. All right, well, PFOS, which is the bad stuff, is a direct result of the electrochemical process, and only the electrochemical process. So if there's any PFOS out in the environment, it came from 3M. Now, the EPA categorizes it as a PBT, which means it's persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. It's persistent because once it's out there, it doesn't go away. It's always there. I venture to say that just about everybody in this room has some level of PFOS in their blood system. I'm probably up to here at it. Um, you buy fast food from McDonald's, it's, it's used for uh, coatings on the wrapper to help deflect some of the grease. Scotch Guard, everybody, Scotch Guard was the main uh, uh, product that was a target and everybody was paying attention to it. They announced they were getting out of this business. Uh, Teflon coating. DuPont buys some of this chemistry from Korea and using their Teflon coating. So it's out there. Uh, it's toxic. So far, they haven't found any immediate health risk. Uh, 3M would monitor all their workers. They could see it building up, but nobody's determined any, any immediate health risk to it. Um, the EPA, of course, is concerned about future risk. Well, they smell blood here. Uh, they've got something to go for, so they're going to continue to look at it. And basically, it was 3M looking at risk and return. You know, if you can trace it all back to them, then they better start getting out of business. <laughs> Um, the telomerization process uh, doesn't contain any PFOS. Uh, the other uh, <coughs> intermediate, which is PFOA, was also uh, resulting from the 3M process. There's no connection with PFOA to this uh, telomerization process either, from my understanding. Um, the EPA and the private concerns are going to continue to study the, the telomeres, <coughs> obviously, because they have some concern. The people who are still out there making foam, all using the same process, are going to band together, and they have. They have formed the Firefighting Foam Coalition, and the big manufacturers out there are Hansel, Buckeye, ChemGuard, and Kitta. And there's some, a lot of minor, I shouldn't call them minor, but there's a lot of other manufacturers of foam concentrate around the world. They're going to get together, and uh, they want to be a source of information, obviously want to lobby and work with the EPA to make sure that they're getting a balanced amount of information to uh, look at this efficiently. And they're going to also uh, research some alternatives. Right now, uh, they've got the EPA saying we got to get rid of this stuff. You've got the U.S. military, the largest user in the world, saying no, we're going to use this stuff because there's nothing better out there. AFFF tomorrow. As I said, the manufacturers are going to continue to uh, make the telomer-based A triple F product. I've heard no talk that there are any of the other ones are thinking about getting out of it. Uh, there's been some rumors that 3M is uh, 
Well, I think they just finally finished their two year going out of business sale. But there's some rumors that they're still looking at different surfactants. I don't think you'll see 3M getting into the foam business, but if they come up with a surfactant, they should be willing to sell it to somebody who does. Um, again, AFFF is still the best product available for its intended use. So I think it's going to be around for a while. Greener the better. I've heard uh, rumbling from one company that they're going to come out with a, uh, a new patented AFFF that's just going to be the cleanest and greenest and best stuff out there. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, that's going to be the trend in the future. Uh, I can take questions now or if you want to wait till after. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, any questions? I'll try to answer them. Are AFFS from both either process compatible with each other? Your uh, your AFFF base product is, um, Tony. Um, the manufacturers, depending on what they're trying to achieve, will say either you can or cannot mix the AFFFs. Mill spec product is required that it's uh, can be mixed with other manufacturers because the military is buying this stuff in huge amounts and then they're storing it and they can't be worried that Ansel's 3% mill isn't going to mix with uh, 3M's 3%. So all the mill is required to be compatible. Um, the alcohol resistant concentrates, that's a little bit different. There, there's some of them out there saying yes, you can mix them together, but the viscosities of the different alcohol resistant concentrates vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. So you, if you need to use an emergency situation, I don't think you're going to have a problem. But I have a problem with taking 50% from one manufacturer and 50% from another and putting it in the storage tank for 10 years. And that's my own personal feeling. I think that's a, a potential problem. If it doesn't work, who's going to accept responsibility for it? Both manufacturers are going to say, well, it's his problem, not mine. <coughs> Any other? Is your bladder tank compatible with coal? Compatible with foam? Yeah, different manufacturers. Yeah, the the bladder is, is <coughs> when you get your UL and FL approval, the bladder has to be subjected to a compatibility test. So what UL does, they, they run as received tests and then they age it, advanced aging, then they soak it and run tests. You have to be 85% of what the, the as received was. The bladder that we've been using for 20 plus years has probably a union over an island. It's kind of been the industry standard. Ansel uses it, National Foam uses it, Buckeye uses it, we've used it. But that manufacturer is not going to provide that anymore. He's going to uh, something that he can heat well. So it's, uh, I think it's a type of neoprene over an island. He wants to get away from the adhesives. It'd be a quicker process to do the heat well. So probably the next couple, two, three months, we're going to have that option. Most of all the bladder materials are pretty compatible. We're using one now, it's a polyester <coughs> over, uh, so it's a neoprene over polyester. That's compatible with Angus, Kitta, which is national foam, and answer foams, and it's going to be compatible with everybody else's too. Anything else? Let them turn it over to Brian. We can get into the technical aspect of it. speak this evening, um, I was asked to speak on detection systems and kind of associate that back to sprinkler systems. Um, you know, when you get a detection system, it's such a broad subject, it's a broad category, and I kind of thought to myself, you know, really what can we talk about that uh, a lot of you folks may or may not know, but I thought, you know, we're asked such basic questions so many times, um, maybe we should just start with the basics here a little bit, and tell what we want to do tonight was really just talk about you know, the four stages of the fire. And a lot of us know three of the four, but there's a fourth stage as well. Um, talk about the detection system that we actually use in each one of those stages of the fire. And 
describe how those devices that we use in that stage actually work, and then kind of associate that with uh, common applications for that detection system within that state of fire. Um, as I was saying, um, many of us here are familiar with the three stages of the fire, that being smoke density, the flame, and heat. But in fact, the very first stage of a fire is what they actually call the incipient stage of the fire. Um, I'm often asked the question, what is incipient stage? Incipient stage is where thermal breakdown occurs when the product overheats. It can be any product out there, sometimes carpet, pine board, PVC. Um, and what we mean by thermal breakdown, a real good example of that is um, if you're driving down the highway on a hot summer day, you look at your windshield and you see this kind of vapor coming off the highway. Um, thermal breakdown is to be more frigid and degradation. Uh, anything that burns uh, will reach its <coughs> thermal particulate temperature. At that point in time, um, the product will start to emit a large quantity of invisible particles. Um, let's talk about these little bit of invisible particles a little bit. Some people refer to as particulates as well. This is some common material up here, um, PVC insulation, and it's actually associated temperature um, where it actually starts to produce these invisible particles. As you can see, PVC insulation is about 290 degrees. Motor oils 310, pine board 320, and, and so forth and so forth. Um, keep in mind that this incipient stage, we're not producing any smoke, there's no flame, there's nothing yet. It's just these invisible particles being produced. So invisible particles are, like I said, invisible and they're very, very small. The actual size of the particle is 0 0.0025 microns. It's invisible to us. Give you an idea how small that is. If you take a strand of your hair, try and look at the diameter, it's 0.5 microns. A better example would be the wavelength of the light is measured at 0.2 microns. So it's invisible. You can't see it. Next question I'm asked quite a bit is, well, if it's invisible, Brian, how do we see it? How do we detect it? And then how do we actually use it from a detection system and release it for reaction or sprinkler or whatever you're going to do with it? Well, how an IFD works, and IFD stands for incipient fire detection, or incipient fire detector. It's a control panel, it's not on the wall. We have an air sampling head out in the field somewhere. The ceiling is up floor, maybe an air conditioning unit, you know, HVAC unit. We actually draw air from the panel or from the sample head back to this control panel. This control panel then has a little tiny chamber, and it has a water source in the panel as well. That chamber, or once the sample is in the chamber, is actually humidified to 100%. And then the particle is, or the sample is subjected to a vacuum. At that point in time, we drop the pressure inside this chamber. The drop of pressure creates the drop of temperature. If we drop the temperature with the humidity that's involved in the chamber, we get condensation. The condensation surrounds the invisible particle. Now the invisible particle particle has been amplified. Kind of make that a little simpler. The end result is basically a cloud. It's just like, like Mother Nature. We have warm, moist air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico up to Minnesota here. It's a low pressure system. What happens? It generate clouds. That's how it works. That's all we're doing here. We're producing a cloud within this chamber. That's how we can actually amplify an invisible particle and see it. So, Applications for that kind of technology, or that kind of detection system. People ask me, well, why, you know, we're trying to convince us or relate this back to a sprinkler system, an intraglot foam system. But yet we can. Um, a lot of applications for that detection system is for data centers or, or cleaner. We're doing a cleaning room here locally. Uh, we're using it. MRI rooms, uh, rack storage, and anechoic chambers. This detection system is really used for the very, very first stage of the fire. Um, but sometimes, like for instance, in an anechoic code chamber, the application really can sometimes dictate, dictate to us what type of detection system we're going to use. So for instance, 
Uh, we're doing two of the projects here, uh, one out in Goleta, California, and one for MIT Lincoln Laboratories in Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, an anechoic chamber, if you don't know what those are, is basically a test cell or a test room where they test antenna strength and signal strength, military and telecommunications streams quite a bit. They do not want any RF frequency waves going in or out of those rooms. But the material, the absorbers that they use to prevent the RF from penetrating is extremely flammable. And also they cannot have any metal put inside those chambers as well. So now we cannot use a common heat detector or a common smoke detector. We actually have to use the plastic air sample and have the plastic pipe going out of the room. So we're actually bringing the air sample out of the room back to the panel to analyze the make sure there's a fire and there is and there is a reaction valve or maybe a foam system as Steve was talking about earlier. So that's the basic, you know, overall two-minute uh, discussion of IFD systems. Um, keep in mind it's just the very first stage of the fire. There's no smoke, there's no heat, there's no flame, it's just invisible particles. Uh, moving right along to the second stage of a fire would be actually smoke density. Obviously we have basically, there's lots of different types of smoke de detectors out there. And um, the most common ones that we use um, would be photoelectric detectors, the spot type, photoelectric projective beams, and ionization smoke detectors. I cannot tell you how many times I sit down in front of a customer or a client, they tell me, you mean there's different types of smoke detectors? I thought a smoke detector was a smoke detector. It's not. And what we kind of discredit people is, you know, this is what we'll talk about photoelectrics and how they work. A photoelectric type smoke detector is based on a light scattering principle. I'm doing my best to describe how this works. We actually have a detector. Inside that detector, we have a light source and a photo sensor. A sensor, a photo sensor. We do not want to be in the light source on the sensor itself. What happens is, is once we bring a particle of smoke in there, it interrupts the light source, creates a flickering or at least a reflection. And that reflection is then reflected back onto the sensor inside the smoke detector, which is like the arm off that sensor, off the flickering of the, uh, the reflection of the light. The most important thing I want to talk about is when to use a photoelectric smoke detector. Uh, photoelectrics tend to be more responsive to visible smoke caused by smoldering fires. The smoldering fire grows without smoke, produces lots of particles. The particles go in the detector, more reflection. But also, photoelectrics tend to be a little less responsive to invisible smoke caused by flaming fires. That's where we're going to want to use ionization detector. We're going to talk about right now. Ion detection detectors are their operation is based on reducing ion mobility or the current change in kind of describe that. We have a detector, a second type. Inside it we have two chambers. In one of the chambers is really a small radioactive material. That radioactive material produces makes ions in there inside the chamber. Those ions are in there and they're all moving around, they're all happy moving, creating this current draw. As air or as smoke particles come in to the chamber, it actually will absorb <coughs> the ions. Now, absorption ions and regular ions are moving back and forth. You change that current flow. You change the current flow. That change in current flow triggers the alarm and the smoke detector actually will take that alarm signal. That signal is sent to a control panel and you can do whatever you want with it. You know, input to, or output to a, a sprinkler system, a foam system, a halon. Type system. But just the opposite of the photoelectric, they seem to be more responsive to visible smoke caused by flaming fires and less responsive to visible smoke caused by smoldering fires. The projected beam type detector, photoelectric, works kind of the same way as the early photo. We have a beam or a transmitter in response to what's going on this end. We shoot a beam across to a receiver. If smoke obscures that beam, absorbs the light and the photosensor is not going to play, it goes into an arm as well. So it does not work on the ion mobility process, it works more on the scattering of the flipping light process. Keep in mind, um, the smoke detectors themselves all go back to the control panel um, to release whatever we're going to release, maybe a foam system. 
were asked quite a bit, you know, what type of detector do you need to use and when do you use it? Unless you really know exactly what kind of fire you're going to get or going to have, what will happen, we really recommend that the best protection for people and property is a combination of both types of detectors. Um, where we can ensure that we may get a small or more, more rapid flame. Um, some people refer to that as what they call a cross zone detection principle. You know, we use a lot of cross zone detection principles in, in these common applications reaction sprinkler systems, atrial um, foam systems, and different clean agent suppression systems. The reason we want to do that is because we kind of want to eliminate false alarms. Um, we have two different types of smoke detectors that do two different things versus the false alarms. Moving right along now to the third stage of a fire would be the flame detection. Right. Yes. When you cross the you cross the line with an ion detector with a full electric you have to have one of each. Uh, so that's right. how you cross them. Yeah, in certain applications we, use, we will do that. Uh, we'll cross them both different types. Uh, in other applications, we will just, most of your detection and control guns have two initiated circuits. So we will put the same type on two different circuits. So that we can also cross them both circuits. We cross them, we'll so go off track here. Smoke detection with low air switches. Flame detection, um, specialized area, used for special applications where hazardous processing or fuel causes fire before smoke. Um, different applications, store groups, and fires. Three basic types that are out there, and keep in mind with all these different detection devices we're talking about, there's numerous types, but the most common in this is uh, ultraviolet flame detectors, infrared flame detectors and a UVIR combination flame detector. Ultraviolet flame detectors. Um, obviously they do exactly what the name said. They respond to the ultraviolet radiation emitted by flames. This is a very, very fast responding type of detector. Um, it's usually used where highly combustible materials are involved. Um, those are going to be one of your coke miner. Different company, we install a lot of these at uh, the coke refinery out there. Pipeline pumping stations, refineries, gas turbines. Uh, so we a lot more of those as well. We're going to use a flame detector for very fast response. Infrared flame detectors, same thing, response to infrared radiation sources caused by the flame itself. But also, IR detectors can go into alarm if we have a flickering black body heat radiation source. People say, what the hell is that, right? Um, <laughs> personally, I <laughs> just looked at um, Black body heat radiation source. Um, these flame detectors all tend to be site specific. They want to look at a specific process and look at a specific item. Um, and let's say they're looking at this process on a refiner or something. Next to it, we have a big boiler, whatever the reason is. Uh, the boiler produces lots of heat. Um, next thing you know, maybe a fan is in the way or something goes in the way that this heat producing item can start to generate a flicker or motion in front of it. IR detectors can't pick that up and can't go into a lot that would satisfy their requirement uh, for that detector. <laughs> Refineries, turbine enclosures, paint spray goes all common areas where we use uh, infrared flame detection. We use combination UVIR detectors as well. Uh, when do we use them? They're typically used when either UV or IR on its own can result in a false alarm. Uh, it's being kind of getting back to what's like a cross zone situation where we want to satisfy the same detector with both. UV and IR source. A common false alarms for UV is lightning and arc welding. I can remember single time. They can break a lot. Common IR false alarms is kind of we talked about that black body radiation. So we want to be careful as to when we want to use the detection, where we want to aim it. Yeah. Keep in mind once again, all these types of detection devices we're talking about, we always go back to the control panel. 
them of some sort. And, and the, what we do typically is uh, that interface to uh, just sprinkle valve, free access system, phone system, or some sort of PA type system as well. Okay, towards the end of this uh, fourth uh, stage of the fire, the heat stage, I believe we have three different types of heat detectors that are most common. Uh, fixed temperature, rate of rise, and linear heat detection. We'll get to what's a fixed temperature? Well, it's a normally open switch that closes um, the detector to its set temperature. Typically, the detectors we use are between 135 and 725 degrees. There are special type of heat detectors that go much higher than that. Those are for real specific applications. And common applications for these types would be large area protection, we have a decent expensive type of detection. Large warehouses, large mechanical rooms, high ceilings, then a lot of aircraft hangers with fixed temperatures as well. We interface the back to home systems, very access radio systems. A rate of rise type of detector. Uh, when the temperature rises faster than 15 degrees, Once again, the common applications are the same as really as fixed temperature, but it's when you want a little faster response time to distribute their fixed temperature. Um, to your warehouses, and actually, one of my favorite detection technologies is the works. Is linear type of detection. Um, we are a distributor <coughs> of numerous products. There's a couple of different types of linear type detection out there. Uh, probably the most known one is called Protect Wire. Uh, we have an alarm line out there, it's a nice product. But um, really what linear type detection is, is you have a cable for a jacket. Inside this cable, you have a couple of individually twisted wires. The wires themselves are individually insulated. And at its set temperature, and typically it's between 155 and 300. 6 degrees, uh, the coating of the insulation of these wires melts inside there. When you toss the two wires together, you create a little short. And that's how the system goes to work. With those types of systems, we're going to get our basic two system sprinkler system. Um, common applications for linear type rack freezer storage. We have a lot of rack freezer storage throughout the country. Uh, so far this year, we've completed uh, actually two of them. Uh, where we were over 100 feet in the air. What we'll do, we'll do a linear heat detection as a separate reaction or foam zone up, up on the ceiling, and then we'll have racks. And then the racks have you know, 100 feet plus in the air. We'll have multiple layer, levels of detection going through there. The reason why this is a nice technology is because it's a lot less expensive than the smoke detector and the rack systems. Plus, in the freezer, application is a lot easier to first run the kind of condensation again. Um, coal conveyors. Uh, kind of something that we so we're doing a big project in Wyoming. A big coal processing facility. Like huge conveyors. The pot latch, ignore uh, They're big wood chip conveyors. All the protective wire goes in there. It goes underneath the conveyor and all put the shroud of it. Um, once again, it's inexpensive for wires on all hours of feet. It <coughs> back to a panel for basic reaction valve or coal system. The aircraft hangers. Uh, about a year and a half ago now, a local airline company here decided to use uh, linear heat protection in their aircraft tanks. Uh, and they did, so it was the 50,000 feet of wire. Uh, what they did is just up in the ceilings, so running back and forth. Uh, they're once again tied into a, you know, an overhead delegate system. I think they're maybe involved in some shit like that. Covered bridges. Uh, we're right now currently down in Illinois, uh, two different counties. All historical covered wooden bridges. Want to know if they're on fire. So we put linear detection on the ceilings and we want to the bridges as well. So many, many different applications for linear heat detection. It's nice because it's, it's relatively inexpensive. A lot less than the flame detection. Uh, I think almost more than high, but it's spot type of detection as well, just because it's a constant detection of all that cable. Okay, Brian, can you tell where the where the wires are fused by resistance, <coughs> like how many feet down the line it is? Yeah, exactly. Um, the cable itself has resistance to it. Um, and what happens is we have a digital meter, usually on the control panel. It's basically just an ohm meter. Uh, when the panel 
required to touch, and it also tells you exactly how many people in front of the locale you are. Um, and that can be really helpful, obviously, if we get an installation where we have thousands of feet of wire on there. It's not a guessing uh, If we have some addressing type panel that can do the same thing, it's a device as far as it gives you the address. But if you're in a freezer or a tunnel situation and you're 900 feet away, you want to know exactly where the alarm is coming. Do you use that wire to wire, let's say, a smoke detector? No. You cannot do that. Um, what you can do with protective wire with linear heat detection, um, you can have, let's say, a 156 degree wire from the panel, maybe going to be going through a process of facility, different parts of the facility, maybe run at different temperatures. You can mix different temperature readings on the same wire running, and we can also then come off smoke detector. Very useful for, for cable trays, especially roofs with cable trays. Cable trays, another perfect application for linear heat detection. There, what we want to typically do is we actually want to kind of like snake back and forth from side to side on the cable tray. Um, a lot of that as well. They also have a couple of special linear type um, wires. They actually sort of mixing temperatures. They call it tri wire. They actually have two different alarm thresholds inside the same jacket. A, I think it's 185 or 220 or something like that. I don't remember out of hand. But it gives you that first stage alarm where you, you want to start investigate and get to the second higher temperature wire melt. And that's actually the interface to your reaction valve. You know, you discharge uh, your system at that point. So you don't also have to use linear protection for fire protection. We work with lots of companies uh, for steam tunnels. Believe it or not, there's no fire protection. Where that break is, it's going to be in the solution. And there's different types. Uh, we, we, we distribute one product line, and a lot of companies here in the office they have one distribute different type. They are pretty much the same thing. Um, design criteria all the types of detection devices and systems we've kind of talked about. And, you know, this is real quick and general basic. But we are uh, about have to follow NFP 72 as well. Criteria and demands management, local authority and jurisdictions, insurance underwriters, and yeah, we have to some specified engineers as well. <laughs> so uh, that's really what I want to talk about tonight. And you know, we can get into you know, talk several hours about specific applications of using heat detectors in specific areas. But I just kind of want to give an overall well-rounded area. Uh, once again, the stages of the fire, the types of detection devices we're using at that stage, and just common applications for those types of devices. Uh, now, everything we can interface back to the reaction, the home systems you've talked about, and can monitor them, and so on. So at this point, are there any questions about detection devices, specific hazards, or applications? If you cut the wire, does that have the same effect as, you know, having the actual fire? Yes, it does. Any um, anytime you, anytime those two wires touch, via melting, via cutting, you know, in a, in a rack, that's a forklift to drive around. If they hit it, crimp it, as it touches, it will do its job. It will send an alarm back to the panel, whatever the panel is constructed to do. It will perform. So if it's broken, is it a trouble signal? It's dead or is it still an alarm? Then it depends on how it's arranged. Well, if it's broken and the wire is touched, it goes into large. Uh, there's not a lot of trouble conditions on that type of panel. Mm -hmm. Trouble, you know, the basic trouble, maybe like a ground fault of some sort or low battery panel. But if those two wires inside touch, um, you will get a long condition. And it's a rigid wire. It's, uh, it's, you can't do 90 degree bends with that. We do radius turns with it. Can it be patched? And let's yes. say there's a break, you don't have to replace everything, right? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> it does not have to be replaced 100%. <laughs> um, what happens is, is once you go into alarm, you can determine where the wire is touched, and with a burnt damage, you can just cut it out and it splice it. There are other types of wire out there that uh, you do have to replace the entire length or the entire section. 
So with this particular brand, we don't have to do that. It's cut up the area. How long has it been around? Um, that particular product, I think 65 years. I think so. been around for quite a while. What type of, like in your residential, your household smoke detector, what type of detector is it? Um, typically, it depends on how much you pay. That's photoelectric. Are there different wires for different environments? I'm sorry, is it, is it? Are there different kinds of wires for different environments, like if you go outside or inside or anything like that? Yeah, there are. There's uh, with uh, the linear detector brand, um, you have different temperature levels, but you also have different types of wires, different jackets. Um, you have jackets for freezers, you have jackets for outside applications, but it's not affected by UVIR. Um, you have jackets for a PV petroleum based area. Um, so it's not uh, effective. But yes, there are different jackets for different applications. So, and, and these are all good questions about, you know, these reds. Now what we just want to do is just kind of give an overall general view once again of these different devices that are out there. Thanks a lot, Steve Brown. Program. Um, that's all we have for tonight. So thanks for everybody for coming. Hope to see you again the next month. We uh, we had had a program set up, but uh, as it turns out the people that we were going to have aren't able to make it on the date that we have for next month. So we're going to change programs. Not sure what it's going to be just yet. Hope to see you anyway. We'll send out an announcement. <coughs> Thank you.